welcome to the Walk Around Podcast, where our goal is to share with you the insights, the skills, the processes, and the leaders that are influencing the retail automotive landscape today. Uh, as always, I'm one of your hosts, Nick Funch, and joined by uh, Danny Vendrell, my better half on the Walk Around. Hello, Danny. How's it going? Uh, it's going good. I'm super excited about our guest today, who really needs no introduction. Um, Brian Benstock is joining us. Uh, good morning, Brian. Good morning. Uh, Brian's the general manager and vice president of the number one certified Honda and Acura dealer in the world, Paragon Honda, Paragon Acura. Uh, he and his team are coming off a month where they led the nation in new Honda sales and CPO sales despite the pandemic. So uh, great job you and the team last month, Brian. Thank you very much. The team really uh, put it all out there and uh, came up with a very, very exciting outcome. So I definitely want to get um, to talk about that outcome today and, and how you did that in spite of some of the challenges in the current environment. But maybe backing up a little bit, um, take us back. How did you get started in, in retail automotive? Wow. Um, my, my father uh, was selling cars back in 1982. And um, as it so happened, I uh, took a year off from college. My father said, you can't live this house one day without a job. And uh, I thought that wasn't fair. And that's <laughs> and, um, so I, I, I took a job in the um, at, at PS Honda in Manhasset, Long Island. Uh, and I, I took this job. I started May 10th, 1982. And I, I simply did it until something better came along. And um, nothing better ever came along. I really saw, I, I really had turned on and tuned into the uh, business. And, um, you know, it was one of those things that the more you learned, the more you earned. And I thought, wow, this could go on forever. And um, and so far, it's gone on forever. So it's, it's really exciting. That's uh that's great. And so I always, I'm always curious around kind of the generational um, impact of the automotive business, how kind of second generations get into it. Anything, um, your dad was in the business, anything that kind of he passed along to you that, that um, helped kind of inspire you in your career? Well, I remember I was still living, you know, LWP, live with parents. I was still living at home yeah. at the time and I was living in the basement of my parents' house. And, you know, I'd go upstairs and I'd do what, you know, dump on the, uh, on the table. Here's what happened today. And here's what, you know, this customer wouldn't buy and here's why. And, and, and my dad was really instrumental in, in going over, hey, well, you should do this and you should try that. And remember, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, a, a be back a be back until they meet a salesperson and all these, these good things. And it was kind of interesting. I started getting some uh, little level of success. I remember there was a, a wholesaler that used to come by the dealership and say uh, to me, are you making uh, $1,000 a week yet? And at the time I was like, $1,000 a week. Now this is 1982. I couldn't dream that big. But he had said it like it was such an expectation that eventually I got $2,000 a week. I said, hey, Johnny, I'm making $1,000 a week. He goes, let me know when you get to $1,500. I'm like, $1,500? I can't get 1500 <laughs> and, 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 you know, after a period of time, um, I was at $1,500 a week. And, 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 and you know, I was really proud and happy to show him, hey, John, I'm, I'm at that. And he said, let me know when you get to 2000 Now, that was, whoa, that's too big for my brain to, to, to uh, you know, really uh, conceive of at that time. But, you know, uh, eventually, I, you know, I got there. And I remember, like it was yesterday, uh, I was so proud. I had a, a very good paycheck, whatever that was, in 1982 or 83. And we used to have a hallway landing with a mirror at our home, and I pasted my paste up there uh, for my dad to see. And I was proud. And um, boy, did I get a good lesson. Uh, my dad started charging me rent uh, living <laughs> in the house. And, 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 you know, and that's a good parent. You know, that's a good parent because uh, he's letting me know, okay, you can handle some more plates on the barbell. And I'm like, wait a second. I lived here for the first 22 years of my life without, why, why can I, I don't understand why I have to pay rent. And he said, because you can. And eventually the rent was so high, I was uh, able to move out and save money. <laughs> so and I think I think that was the object of the game uh, was to get me to move out. Uh, but really a great uh, story and a great start in the business. And I, I worked around some really exceptional uh, managers uh, or manager and uh, owner, Paul Singer, and uh, a, a manager, Nancy Phillips, who were instrumental in setting the right path for me. And I think, you know, as leaders in our industry, we forget sometimes how important uh, it is uh, to have great leadership and 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 even more importantly how um, people are watching what we do people are watching what you do and so those actions that you take or you don't take are being observed by many many people and I remember uh, the incredible integrity 
that both Nancy Phillips and Paul Singer had at all times. And, and that was really instrumental because quite frankly, in the eighties, many of the car dealers were, were, were not the kind of people that I'd want to aspire to be. You know, you picture the typical car salesperson, you picture somebody who's perhaps not in shape, uh, perhaps uses uh, not the best language, perhaps has a pinky ring on and, a, and, 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 you know, and it's just, it was, uh, you didn't want to be that. Uh, but, but that was not, uh, Nancy was elegant and eloquent. And so was Paul. And they, they were people that I aspired uh, to, to be more like, and they really set a good pace and a good path for me to uh, be on. And I'm still on that path. How did, um, so how did their leadership and, and kind of their vision, uh, it's interesting you brought up some of the kind of stereotypical um, automotive retail, that stereotypical automotive retail experience. How did that lead you towards kind of this mantra around the future being frictionless and, and how you can focus? on customer experience you know i think when i when i got to the privilege to be a manager of the store and and, and paul singer said uh you know there were many people that wanted that job and, and mr singer had a number of dealerships at the time and many uh, many managers were fighting for the general manager position at the store that i was working and i i interviewed for the job and i really didn't have the experience to be a manager but i thought I, you know i could outwork anybody and um and, and my early 20s, I guess it was about 25 at the time that the position came available and I applied for the job and uh, he interviewed me and he was asking me really difficult questions that I couldn't answer, like what formal management training have you had? And, you know, I didn't have any. And um, and, and what uh, experience do you have hiring people? And I didn't have any. And I realized uh, that I was up against the ropes and, um, and he, he took a break to consult with his partner. And they let me out of the room, and, and when I went up, went out of the room, I had a sweat ring down to just about my waist. I was, and, and I realized I was, I was, I was not doing well. And I went back in there, and I told him, "I will outwork anybody you can hire. I, um, I know every person in this dealership, and uh, I will make sure that the things that made me successful as a salesperson, I used to make them successful." And uh, he gave me thirty days. He gave me a 30 day trial. And if you remember in the, uh, in the eighties, 85, 86 inventory wasn't plentiful. And I, I worked every hour that that store was open, uh, in, in that 30 day period. And I'm proud to say we sold every car, every car that we had in inventory, not most, not many, every car. And I took a Polaroid picture of myself standing in an empty lot and I sent it to my former boss who had moved on to get her own dealership, Nancy Phillips. And I said, look, we sold all the cars. And, um, and, and our average gross was pretty good, you know, was, and, and I, I won't say what it is, but it was pretty good. Uh, it was real good. And uh, at the end of the month, Mr. Singer came uh, to the dealership, had his pot of coffee and poured a cup of coffee and said, you had a respectable month. I'll give you another 30 days. <laughs> And, and I didn't know, but at the time we had, we had really, really done well. And they were laughing, you know, that uh, the output that they were able to get. And, and, it, and it started me uh, on my journey. And I, I had a lot of good luck. You know, it was the um, 1985. We had the Reagan economy, which provided ample wind at my back. I had very good leadership around me. So these things combined like training wheels uh, to give me the momentum that I needed to deal with the business as it changed in the early nineties, when even for Honda, it became a little bit of a difficult business and, and then to prepare me for, uh, a, a hurricane, a flood, uh, a recession, a COVID virus. These are just things that, you know, uh, the bumps in the road now. Yeah. So but it's interesting. Uh, we we're maybe saying the same thing, Nick, but it's interesting to hear you say that because, I think that's kind of the nature of the business. Like there's, you can't put a dollar value on just good old fashioned hard work showing up every single day and the value that that brings. But once that clock turns over to the first of the next month, it all starts over and we're back at square one and it's back to, to making it happen. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we, you know, we, we joked about it many, many years later, you know, I still got another 30 days and, you know, you said you get, you get 60 now. Um, but, but, you know, <laughs> you know it, I, I think you have to approach every day. Like it's your first day on the job. You really have to have that, you know, you got to earn your spot. And, and unfortunately, uh, many of us that have been around for a while think that there is some residual there. And there, there really isn't, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a professional athlete. You've got to be out there on the court. And I, I love in that, uh, that series, the last dance, uh, with Michael Jordan. I love that there was a, um, Jordan said every game I go out there and there's somebody in the audience that's seen me live for the first time. 
and I've got to make sure that I, I put it out there for them. And I, I thought, man, that, that's such a great way of looking at it. Every day, there's a new salesperson out there, doesn't know who I am, doesn't know what I've done, and they don't care what I've done. They, they care what, what's in it for them. What, what can I share with them? How can I lead them? And I, and I think that's, that's motivational to me and it's inspiring to me to keep me in, in check. You know, are you going to check out early tonight? Remember, you got a whole group of people that don't know about the number of nine to nines or seven day weeks that you work. They're just looking that, hey, th this guy's the boss and he's taking off early. And, and, and that's not the example that was set for, uh, for me. My boss uh, could outwork anybody. And I, and I can remember getting to the store, at, you know, quarter to nine and seeing his, uh, his car parked there. And I can remember leaving at nine o'clock and his car was still there. And I'm like, damn. And uh, here's an a, a interesting story, right? There was um, uh, sometime after he passed away, I was talking to um, his, his wife and I was saying, you know, I, I used to work every Sunday uh, also. And I, and I used to say, uh, how could I you know, tell my wife, how could I stay home? Uh, when Mr. Singer's working. And Mrs. Singer says to me, I can't believe it. He, my husband used to say to me, how can I stay at home when the kids are working in the store? And so, <laughs> you know, so it was this, you know, the you know, gift of the Magi, you know, we're, 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 we're both putting it out there. And I, and I think in business, you know, Pippin needs Jordan, Jordan needs Pippin. You need to have people uh, whether their position is a higher rank or a lower rank that inspire you. And I, I'm blessed to have uh, uh, a young group of people and young, not necessarily in their age, but young in their experience, young in their, their attitude towards the business. And, and, and that's keeps, it gets me turned on. I, I made a couple of management changes in the store and the results have been like wicked, unbelievable, crazy. And, you know, so it, it just reminds me that there's always somebody fresh that wants to come in and, and to be a deep impact player. And you've got to make sure that you make room for talent all the time time and and uh so we're going through some wonderful changes at the dealership that led us uh last month to bring the title back to the east coast as the number one honda dealership in the country and, and i think uh, in in the world last month which is kind of fun yeah that's um definitely something to uh hang your hat on um and the the importance of team and the other thing that the came out of the last dance that i really enjoyed was how important practice um, is and how important kind of getting prepared for those moments. Um, it just makes you that much well, more. Well, well, Manny, Manny, Manny Pacquiao said uh, quite accurately, training hard, fight easy. You know, the, the training, the, you know, if you put in, I'm, I'm a runner, a marathon runner, and if you put in the, the time and the training, right, when it comes to the race, you know, my, my coach said the hay is in the barn. You're good. Yeah. You're good to go. And, and and you're nervous. You know, in the first mile, it's like you've never run 10 feet, although you, <laughs> you've trained seven, 800 miles leading up to a marathon. And you get out there and, and you all, and all of a sudden you, you get into that gear and that gear is you can go forever. And, you know, that's a, that's Nirvana to me. And, and I think it's the same thing in business. You know, I think some of the youngsters that uh, take over the dad's car business but didn't come up through the ranks the hard way are and do suffer because we've done this so many times when a situation happens you don't think it's reflex right if i'm going to throw a baseball at your head you're not going to think what do i do you're going to put your hand up or you're going to duck or and you know i think with what we do and in leading people, you, you've got to have that skill set in your Rolodex, your mental Rolodex of what, what number to call, what place, what play to, to play. And, I, and that, that only comes with experience. And, you know, another thing that's disappeared is, you know, for many people, too many people is work ethic. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I still think nothing beats hard work. You can be smart. Uh, but if given a choice between being smart and working hard, uh, I'd rather work hard. And if you're smart and you work hard, well, that's a pretty good combination. Yeah, it's electric for sure. Yeah. Uh, pivoting just a bit, um, talking about customer experience. And, and, you know, I've heard you talk about how important kind of that frictionless environment is. What does that mean to you? Well, you know, we're not in a frictionless environment. I am uh, striving to get there. And so I'm going to say it's a less friction environment. And, okay. uh, you know, when we take a look at um, what we do and what we transact, you know, we've got this road to the sale. Everyone's got a, their own 
uh, variation of it, you know, opening investigation, selection, demonstration, verification, appraisal, close, TO. And, and there's, there's a logical order there uh, for, for that. But this was not built around the customer. This was built around our needs to be able to investigate, to find out their needs, you know, a needs analysis, select, and all these things. And, you know, uh, today, those, um, it's almost like the last minute of a football game. That, that process has been condensed because the customers have done much of that research online. So it, we, we've got to respect that. We've got to pivot also. And that enables them to get the transactions done much more effectively. But if we're going to make them go through this archaic process, well, th th there's a lot of friction in there. And that friction uh, is uh, customer dissatisfaction. In that friction is uh, time. And people don't want to waste time today. So, you know, to me, a frictionless environment is going to be one where we're having a conversation. I tell you what I want. The car shows up. And, and you know, we've basically been able to do that with service uh, and uh, with the Google Assistant, with the, uh, the product or process that we created with, uh, with Google, where we say, hey, uh, Google, talk to Paragon Honda, and I can book a service appointment in about two minutes. Um, and the, now, somebody might say, well, that's not great. What's the two minutes? Well, the average appointment takes about six minutes to book, so we're, we've already cut that down by two-thirds. But what's more important is I don't have to touch. I don't have to swipe. I can just use my voice to make the appointment. And then the confirmation email gets sent to me of when my appointment is. Confirmation uh, gets put on my calendar, uh, and, and I'll get a confirmation text reminding me of when that uh, appointment is. Oh, and did I mention you don't have to come to us the car will be uh, picked up from your house. Uh, the, the, and, and, and as we looked at that, what role does a consumer play in having their uh, car service? What role do the, does their presence play? And the answer was for us, they don't need to be there at all. We need them to be there because we want to upsell them. We want to sell them more. Somehow, if they're in front of us, we think we can sell more. And, and that's just not fair to the customer. Uh, they know what they want, and uh, if, they, if they're, let's say, having a 15,000-mile service, uh, we can pick up the car and do the service. If additional work is detected uh, and, and needs to be done, we can provide 100% transparency today with video or uh, photography to show them, uh, here are your brakes. They, uh, here are what new brakes look like. Here are what your brakes look like. Would you like to buy some? And, and, you know, more often than not, if we make it convenient for the customers, they will take care of what they need to get, you know. And, and, uh, and again, I'm not talking about selling services that are not necessary. Um, what, what, think of your experience at a service department. You bring your car in for an oil change. You wait 45 minutes to get written up. You get written up. You're sitting there in the lobby. You wait another 40 minutes or so for your car to get pulled inside. They pull it inside. They put it up in the air. The dealership does a good job inspecting the car, and they realize you need brakes. They're going to walk out to you and say, Mr. Smith, um, you need new brakes. Um, and and what, you, you have two questions. What are those two questions? Well, I mean, how much and why kind of almost. Well, how much is right and how long? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And you're not going to like either. Eight. Remember, I set the frame. You're sitting there already an hour. Yep. And they said, you need breaks. So, so you can say how much and how long, and you're not going to like either answer that we give you um, for when we, when we have the customer's car, when we've picked up the car, we've taken the time element out of it. They're still going to ask how much, and it's still going to seem more than they want to pay. But you, know, you say to the customer, the car's already here. It's up in the air. It's going to be less expensive to do it now than any time in the future. And more often than not, customers stay okay. So, so you're actually providing a multiple benefits to the consumer. Um, the other thing we started looking at more carefully is the math. And the math is 94, 95%, 96% of the time, you're not using your car. Right? We're on this call right now. None of us are using our car. If our car needed service, why not do it now and make more effective use of my time? I could get a text from the dealership that says, Mr. Benstock, your car has been picked up. Mr. Benstock, your car is ready. Mr. Benstock, your car is back on its way. And, and I just push a button and sign. And it's complete convenience to me. And, and I'll pay extra, although we're not charging extra, I'll pay extra for that convenience. And so will most of our customers. I'm reminded of uh, one of my mentors in the business who used to talk about when manufacturers were harping on kind of the time and CSI question, does it take too long or, or whatever the question was framed. Um, and he used to say, well, the root of that cause is customers don't want their time wasted, which is, I think, what you're, it's not that it takes long, it's that they're, we're wasting their time and how can we kind of find efficiencies through that. For the first time in history, uh, customers have uh, placed a higher value on time than money. Yeah.
and, and, and it's factual. They, they, they put value, more value on their time than they do on their money. And so now, more than ever, when we're wasting a consumer's time, they, they will get angry and they'll get back at us for wasting mm. the time. Yeah. And they'll get back at us with never again, arms folded. I'm not doing this uh, again. So I, 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 I think it's uh, incumbent on us as an industry to look for ways to make better use of the customer's time. And how did, so how did that help? I'm imagining it was a significant boon during the pandemic. How, how did that help kind of over the past six months as, as we've navigated as an industry, these waters? Well, well, man, we were ready. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, we started doing pickup and delivery for service, um, early 2017. Uh, and I guess, um, by the end of 2017 in August, we picked up about six, 600 cars for service during the month of August, 2017, a year later in August of 2018, that was 1900 cars in the month of August. It tripled last year. In August, it was 3,000 customers' cars that we picked up for the month. So, you know, obviously the customers are responding, saying, hey, yeah, this works for me. And they're servicing more frequently. They're spending a little bit more per transaction because we're making better use of their time. And when, when COVID hit, customers did not want to go into a service department. They did not want to sit in the lobby. Uh, and so, you know, we, we found we were able to do some pretty good business by picking up the customer's cars, servicing them. And more importantly, it laid the groundwork for us to be able to deliver cars to customers because we already had a driver's network in, in place, right? We already had a process in place where they could know like an Uber type of app where they could see uh, the car being uh, delivered to them. They could see where the driver was. So, you know, you, you hate when uh, you're having a delivery and they tell you the driver will be there between two and four o'clock and the driver gets it. The driver gets there at one and you're not ready. Or the driver gets there at five and you, you're tweaked. Um, uh, this is, gives the customer very much like an, an Uber app uh, where they know within minutes exactly where the driver is at all times. That makes better use of the customer's time and the driver's time. So, you know, it works, it works mutually beneficial, which I think is always the best way. And um, in the month of April, no, May, we delivered, we, the store was closed. We delivered 732 cars uh, without customers coming to the store. And now we lost buckets of money. Um, uh, and I'm not happy about that, uh, but it really proved out that we could, at scale, deliver vehicles. And I, and, and I, and I suggest the only reason that we didn't have a good outcome uh, financially is because that number uh, is ordinarily uh, 12, 1,300 cars a month, so we we're half the volume level that we ordinarily were, and we had a, a considerably reduced staff. You know, we, so we had all the expense and just not the not the revenue. But it was it was great for us uh, because now uh, the pickup and delivery for sales has been a much larger portion of our business than it was prior. Mm -hmm. And and through that process, kind of COVID forced you all, and I think a lot of dealers, to look at what can we do right now? Although it's not 1300, it's 700. What can we do right now to facilitate the 700? And then now we've got those, like we were talking about before, those sets and those reps, and we've built those muscles. We're now, we're starting to open up again and things will, will come back to normal, but you have a process in, a, in place and a system that will hopefully allow you to continue to be successful in that way. Hey, not to plug JM&A, but, um, you know, we had a couple other things that we put in motion a couple of years ago. I met uh, uh, one of your uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, people, Heather, and Heather and I had a conversation about two and a half years ago about, hey, how do we do this financing remote, remotely? And in, in really in preparation for to be able to have a online transaction without forfeiting one of the most um, profitable portions of that transaction, which is the finance and insurance aspect of it. And we started working on that with, with Heather uh, and your team about two, two and a half years ago. And thank goodness for that, uh, because we, we already had the, uh, the pipes and the pipeline in place for us to do pickup and delivery and to handle the finance in a, a transparent uh, manner for our consumers. And, and, and that really helped out. And I, I have to tell you, and uh, we, we have some big plans for what we're going to do uh, surrounding used cars and um, some real Carvana-like stuff that's coming uh, where, where you guys are going to play an even uh, increased uh, role and importance to the dealership as we uh, continue to be distributors of transportation. 
Well, I think, um, you know, what's nice about that is our um, I can, business goals align, right? It's, it's how do we kind of um, enable uh, a better transaction for the end users of the, um, of the vehicle, but then also how do we um, do it in a way that's uh, profitable for the dealership as well? And, um, and protect so the customer experience and the profitability. And um, we've got a long ways to go, but I think we're, we're uh, down the right path and, and certainly excited about um, what's Yeah, I, I, I think we're in a good place so long as we continue to focus on the end user, on the customer. And, and the second we start worrying about the dealership's profitability uh, with respect to building technology and, and products, I think we're in trouble. I think we, we need to be talking about what makes the experience better for the consumers. How do you want them to feel after they've done business with you? Uh, and as uh, if we can improve upon that outcome, then I think the profitability will take care of itself. Uh, when, when you start trying to create things uh, uh, in, in, without really taking into consideration how that's going to impact the customer, uh, then I think you're, you're going down the wrong path. Because remember, we don't disrupt anything. We're not disruptors. The customers are the disruptors, and the customers disrupt with their wallet, you know, they, they, and they vote with their wallet. And 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 so when you've made it easier, that you get you know a piece of their wallet. Uh, and if you make it more difficult, you don't get that piece. And and that customer shifting, the customers are always going to do what's in their intelligent self-interest. So we have to make sure that our options are what's in the intelligent self-interest of the consumer. And in the world great. that we kind of live in. It's almost like, hey, we're just aligning with what that self-interest is and what their expectation is for every other part of what they're consuming. As a, as a consumer, you talk about Netflix, you talk about Amazon Prime. It's so easy. It's so frictionless. We're aligning the dealership experience with kind of the way that they're used to buying things in, in most of the other sectors of, of what's going on and how they're using their purchasing power. And so a question that I have is, you know, when we look at... Um, what you guys have done on the sales side. and you're kind of on the, the tail end of that bell curve where you've, you've adopted it, you've rolled it out, you're learning to scale it, you're making it happen in a successful way for a dealer. That's an er on the other side of that. Hey, I don't, I don't have those processes, but I understand that this is what consumers expectations are. What would your advice be to, to a dealer like that as like a step one? Well, step one is to realize that consumer sentiment's shifting, and 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 ask yourself, you know, you've got the the the, the four E's, right? E one is envision. What's your vision for your dealership? And you know, I think if you're a, a GM or a dealer and you don't have a vision, uh, that's that's a problem. E E E two is to energize your team around that vision, your vision uh, for the dealership, and, and E three is execute. And we're Right now, I think the team is clear on my vision. They're energized around it, and we're working on the execution. The execution part is really where the rubber meets the road. Remember, there's never been a better time in the history of planet Earth to be a consumer than right now. This is it. There has never been a better time. Not ancient Rome, not, not, not during any period in, in the global history. Right now, the consumer is king. It's easier for them to buy anything they want right from this device and have it shipped anywhere. So if we don't address that reality, if we don't pivot to that reality, I, I, I think that dealer could be in trouble. And, you know, and, and I know a lot of dealers that are super successful that are saying, hey, this is not for me. I'm not doing it this way. And that, that's okay. But, but I do think uh, uh, that COVID has accelerated the move to digital and automotive by five to 10 years. You know, that was already underway, right? And there were many dealers that were kicking and screaming, dabbling in that direction. It's amazing how many people were contacting Roadster. Uh, I need a digital platform, please. You know, yeah. Rudy, Rudy at Roadster has been knocking on doors for, you know, years now saying, hey, you got to prepare. And everyone's, ah, I don't need that. And all of a sudden, I, I couldn't get him on the phone. That was one of his first dealers. I, and he's like, Brian, I'm so busy. I, because all of a sudden, all the dealers wanted the solution. Now, here's the strange thing. Many of the dealers bought the solution and it's sitting on the shelf in the dealership. They're really not continuing to develop this as the showrooms have been allowed to open up and customers are coming back in. They're allowing that normalization to take, uh, to take hold. I think the smart 
uh, play is to, yes, allow your customers, of course, welcome your customers to come into the store, but continue to develop your online processes. This is not going away. This is going to accelerate. And, and I, I do think that COVID uh, and the pandemic have accelerated that transition uh, by five to 10 years. It's interesting. I think you started early on talking about the, the road to the sale and how the road to the sale is really about us. And, you know, that might be a good good way for us to put a bow on the conversation today where, where kind of meet the customers where they want to be met. And, um, and make, when you make it about them, you kind of shift that mindset a little bit. It, um, it's, it's not going to be easy, but directionally, I think that's where we should head. So. Wherever, whenever, however, on whatever device. Right. So somebody wants to use an iPhone. Somebody wants to use a laptop. Somebody wants to use an iPad. Somebody wants to use a desktop. Somebody wants to use a telephone. Somebody. You know, and and so you can't bet on one against the or over the other. You, you've got to be flexible, you know, wherever, whenever, however, on whatever device they want. And, and and so, you know, are you available 24 hours a day? Is your store available 24 hours? You'd be shocked how many people go online and transact with Paragon at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And why not? They're sitting in bed. They go yeah. boom, boom, pop, pop over the pop open the laptop, and, and let me see what's here. And if you're the only game in town, you win. Uh, so, so have you geared your store to that? We're, we're beta testing some cool uh, AI uh, where we can now pretty much do a transaction 100% uh, with um, AI and chat bots. And it's really interesting to walk in on any given day and have three deals already done from the night before. And, and, and you just read the whole transaction and all we have to do is, okay, give me the insurance card and let's go. And, and again, um, I don't think Apple cares if you go into the Apple store and buy an iPhone or you buy it online. And isn't it, haven't they really mastered that where the experience buying something online from them and buying it in the store is completely different, but completely the same at the yeah. same, you know, it's got the same feel, right? If I'm, yep. a, if I'm on the uh, computer buying something from Apple or my phone or in the store, it's got the same feel. And, and so uh, we're not there at all. But, I, I, but that's the nirvana for us to, is to get there, uh, to get the look of the place, the tech of the place, uh, to be seamless, and for us to just not give a hoot uh, how they transact with us so long as they transact with us. Yeah, I think that's um, wise words I think we can all use. So a couple of things I took out of the conversation today, uh, Brian, and thank you very much for your time, is, is number one, probably most importantly, don't underestimate the value of hard work. Um, you know, that, that can cure a lot of ails, right? Putting the time in. And then I love the three E's as kind of a strategy around envisioning um, what your plan is, energizing your team toward that plan, and then um, execution. There's, so, a four, there's a fourth E. Okay. And, and, and the fourth E is to exit. There you go. And so, you, you know, as a leader, have the vision, energize, execute, and then realize when it's your time to go. You got to go. And yeah. that's, that's, you know, we all know sports, boxing, especially people that stay around too long. And, uh, yeah. you know, th thankfully, we don't, uh, what we do is not physical. So you can stay around a little bit longer, but, but, but make you make, make room for the youngsters so that they can come up and, uh, you can give the baton to them and, and sure, guide them there, but you've, you've got to, uh, you know, plan the exit. Brian, where can our listeners uh, find you? I know you're LinkedIn, Twitter, pretty much anywhere. There's yeah, I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or, or BrianBensock.com. Uh, we, we, we share information uh, freely uh, because the the better the industry gets, the better we get. And uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty accessible and uh, an open book. I love talking to dealers uh, and, and uh, doing uh, our fair share to try and push us all in a good direction. Well, we've enjoyed uh, chatting with you on the walk around here. Danny, any uh, closing comments? No, thank you so much. It's been great to uh, just have these conversations with you, see where the industry is going. And we're, we're just going to, we're along for the ride and we're all aligning those, uh, what we're doing, the consumer expectations. And it's a great industry to be in. So. It, it sure is. Danny, good, good, good talking with you today. Mm -hmm.